Hey everybody, uh, it's Castro Hansen here from the Spartan Group with uh, Ken Work from uh, Synthetics. Um, we'll we'll kick it off uh, just a little bit about Spartan. We are a um, advisor, investment bank in crypto. We also have a hedge fund and two venture funds, as well as a, a venture builder, Spartan Labs. I'm one of the co-founders. Been around in crypto for for just over five years, uh, and obviously been following DeFi and uh, and synthetics since its uh, since its genesis. Um, but just, um, Kane, uh, thanks for doing uh, this session with us today. Um, I think the audience is a bit mixed in terms of their knowledge of synthetics and, you know, a knowledge of, of you and, and the whole background. So maybe we could just kick it off with you giving a bit of your, your crypto story, like how you ended up in this, this sector, uh, like when and how did you get into the space? Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's it's interesting. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, the the kind of Ethereum DeFi ecosystem probably doesn't have as much exposure. You know, there was a period where it was like the only game in town, and and so kind of everyone knew all the different projects. But um, yeah, synthetics and and some of the other um, you know earlier DeFi projects, I think uh, you know might still need uh, some explanation. So, synthetics actually started as a stablecoin. Uh, interestingly, um, it, it was called Haven. Um, and the idea was basically like a, a payment network. So we started that in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, when uh, USDC and a bunch of the other kind of regulated stable coins, uh, you know, launched um, uh, to compete with USDT, we decided to pivot um, away from a pure stable coin. Uh, and we basically created like this uh, basket of different stable coins, different assets that track different prices. Um, so we did gold and silver and Bitcoin. Um, we have a, a synthetic version of Ether as well. Um, and yeah, that it's, you know, it's kind of started, uh, from that pivot and, and, you know, we were involved in yield farming early on. Um, so the, some of the other fun stuff, uh, in DeFi that, that went on in, in DeFi summer. Um, and then it's just expanded into an ecosystem now where there's, I think, um, maybe seven or eight different projects that are uh, building on or integrating synthetics, uh, you know, as part of their, their kind of core platform and, and the synthetic asset, uh, tokens that we issue. Great, and when you um, when you did that pivot um, from kind of a, a pure uh, stablecoin into synthetics, like what, from your perspective, what were you what problem were you trying to solve, or what were you trying to add to the ecosystem that you felt the other kind of stablecoins and projects didn't offer? Yeah, I think the initial stablecoin design was supposed to be a purely crypto collateralized stablecoin, right? So you know, the, like I say, when I say purely uh, crypto collateralized, like ideologically pure as well, right? So the idea was right. to not be reliant on any trust, you know, in any uh, custodian or anything like that. Um, you know, similar to how Maker started, obviously being like an, an ETH, uh, ETH collateralized stablecoin. Obviously, Maker um, has has you know gone down a different path where there's a lot of USDC and now. Maybe U.S. Treasuries backing the stablecoin, um, so there aren't a huge number of decentralized options. But back then, I think we just saw, you know, DeFi was was not even uh, coined as a term, right? It, it wasn't until late in 2018 that that kind of happened, um, and we just saw that, you know, for most people, what they wanted was stablecoins to trade on centralized exchanges. And you know, a, a stablecoin like USDC was just going to be hard to beat. Um, and so, uh, when we launched uh, synthetic gold, synthetic silver, and some of the other, uh, you know, more um, I guess speculative assets, um, that's when uh, I think you know people started to get much more interested in the project. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, we just realized that. Uh, a USD stablecoin is probably going to be a hard uh, game to win, and you know, going down to like a, a longer tail of assets was was probably going to be more, um, you know, more interesting for the community. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting to work in a sector where you, you, you know, you, we're in the sector for a number of years, and then later on, it gets coined and defined as kind of DeFi, and it's kind of like, oh, that's what we're working in. It's called DeFi now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same with like Web three, right? Um, so in, in terms of just taking one step back, I mean, the term synthetic means, you know, uh, most people that are not finance savvy, you know, uh, probably come across it in terms of what kind of clothes they're wearing or the fabrics. Um, so just walk us through in terms of, a, you know, in the DeFi ecosystem, like what, how is synthetic versus real? Like how, what, what is a synthetic yeah. product? Yeah, so I, you know, I think uh, maybe if you compare um, like the different versions of uh, Bitcoin, that, that exist right on uh, on the Ethereum network, right, or even on the Ethereum uh, on on the Bitcoin blockchain. So you know, there's Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is the asset itself, right? That's where it lives. That's its native 
place. Um, you know, it's a it's a uh, sort of a digital asset um, that exists on that blockchain. But that blockchain doesn't do very much um, other than store Bitcoin and transfer it. Um, and so, you know, you have this programmable blockchain in Ethereum where a lot of people want Bitcoin. And so the question is, how do you get Bitcoin onto the Ethereum blockchain? How do you, you know, uh, interact with it, trade it, transfer it, um, you know, use it as collateral, et cetera? Um, and there are a number of approaches. Um, you can have something like wrapped Bitcoin, where you take Bitcoin that's, you know, in uh, an address on the Bitcoin blockchain and being custodied uh, by, you know, some off-chain uh, custodian. Um, and then they basically give you an IOU, a, a wrapped version of Bitcoin um, that you can trade, right? So it's, it's you know, fully backed by the, by the asset itself. Um, what we do is, is slightly different, where we say we don't actually want to have any uh, kind of, you know, trusted uh, party holding Bitcoin for you to, to give you um, that, you know, exposure to a Bitcoin token, an ERC-20 token on the year blockchain. So we use uh, price oracles, and a number of other mechanisms to basically issue a token that tracks the price of Bitcoin uh, without actually being, you know, Bitcoin itself or without being kind of backed by Bitcoin. Right. Um, so it, it's just a way of, of kind of giving people exposure to an asset that doesn't natively exist on that on that network, on the Ethereum network. So is, is it fair to say that in terms of at least a decentralized portion of the DeFi, it's more pure, it's a more pure product in that sense, because you're not dependent on a, yeah. on, on, a, on a centralized party in the same way as a wrapped token? Exactly. Yeah, it is. Um, obviously, there's trade-offs, right? There's, you know, yeah. there's trade-offs in, in any design. Um, and one of the trade-offs is that um, you know, if you really like custodians and you really trust that custodian, um, then, you know, the peg that you have on something like wrapped Bitcoin uh, is always going to be tighter, right? Because there's this redemption component. Um, when you have like a, a synthetic uh, crypto collateralized version of an asset or, or a token, uh, there's you know going to be some uh, variance around the peg. It's not going to be a, a perfect yeah. peg because... You yeah. know, so so there's trade-offs. There's trade-offs. You get you on, know, on the other less... hand, you don't have counterparty credit risk. Like exactly, which, which, <laughs> which version, turns out doesn't a, work out is a problem, right? Yeah, exactly. It can be a big discount. Who knew? Yeah, who knew right. that the uh, right. counterparty risk was such a big deal? So yeah, yeah. I think that's that's uh, just speaking of that. What, what, there's a lot more. There's a lot going on in the synthetics ecosystem and 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 with the products. But just before that. I just want to get your kind of take on a, on a few things in the market. I mean, obviously, it's been a, a very interesting time um, in the markets. Uh, also, for you know, for those of us that have been around for for a few cycles and a few turns of it, um, I, I think th this one has been particularly popcorn worthy, right? Just in terms of the following yeah. what's going on, and you know, between Voyagers, Celsius, Three Arrows, uh, Babel Finance, and a, a number of other names. Um, there's been a lot of exposure and contagion in the ecosystem. Just um, wondering whether, from you know, from a synthetics perspective, is synthetics impacted in any way, or any of the you know, the protocols or pro projects building on top of synthetics impacted by this? Not really. Um, you know, uh, synthetics being a pure DAO um, doesn't uh, have any uh, legal entities. Um, so, you know, thankfully, uh, the the synthetics project. Um, couldn't, you know, turn up to uh, a Celsius, not that we would have necessarily done this, but, um, you know, turn up to a Celsius and say, hey, um, you know, A, we want to lend you some of our assets or or B, we want to borrow from you. Um, neither of those things is, is really possible because we don't have any legal entities. Um, so we're kind of forced into an environment where we only do things that are on chain. The nice thing about only doing things on chain is that you're only interacting with other DeFi protocols and other DeFi protocols have been uh, fairly robust through this this period. So, um, you know, I think uh, in some ways we're, we're lucky to not have to worry about that kind of, uh, you know, off-chain CeFi contagion. That said, right. you know, you can't you can't get away from the impact, right? It's it's impacted everyone. Price action has been um, you know fairly negative lately, and and you know sentiments uh, been been negative. But I do feel like uh, at least you know I'm, I'm here in um, in Paris at ECC. It feels like within the Ethereum community, uh, people are are you know still like fairly positive. You know, it feels it feels optimistic right. uh, out there. So, and ju just on that point, I mean, you're obviously very close to the ecosystem and have you know, been for, for many years, but especially this first half of the year has been quite of a, you know, um, emotional roller coaster for a lot of people, especially, you know, the, the vintage that maybe came in with uh, either DeFi summer or NFT uh, boom, right, uh, where maybe haven't seen something like this before. 
what what's your feeling from being around DCC the last few days um, versus like you know May, April, March? Like, have has a sentiment bottom, so to speak? I mean, who knows about prices, but how do you feel about the overall sentiment? Yeah, I, I think you know to to go back to like earlier cycles and, and look at how how it felt. Um, you know, late 2018, uh, we kind of had capitulation um, in in the broader crypto markets, right? And and you know, while we had uh, kind of you know Ethan BTC trading sideways for you know almost six months back then in, in 2018, there was a lot of fear because it was like, when is you know when's the penny going to drop here, right? Um, and people were on edge, and and you know it felt like once that capitulation candle hit. Even though everything was worse in terms of you know like the projects were um, you know were in were worse positions in terms of runway and like all of that stuff, there was something uh, that was like a little bit freeing, and it felt like in that early 2019 period, a lot of projects were just like, all right, like it's happened, you know, we've been the, the capitulations happened, like let's uh, you know let's really just focus on building and, and kind of grind our way up out of here, um, and so you know projects like Compound and Uniswap and Ave and you know all of the uh, the projects that you know um, we know as part of that that DeFi summer period really um, you know the momentum started in early 2019. That was kind of when when things really kicked off, um, and it does feel like you know even if we haven't hit capitulation yet um, in the market, and, and maybe there's still some pain to come, that uh, it does feel like flushing out all of this like contagion and the three arrow stuff and Celsius and everything has kind of uh, put people in a mindset where. Um, everyone's really focused. It feels like there's there's a big focus on building um, and a big focus on you know returning to fundamentals as well, um, which you know is nice, right? If you're building something that has fundamental value, it's nice when all of a sudden people recognize fundamentals are important again. So, yeah, I guess ETC is also a little bit more of a builders conference in in many ways, right? Yeah, um, yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. So yeah, in, in terms of the people on the ground building, it, it definitely incentivizes us all to do. Great. And you know, one of the things that you, you were talking about earlier is just kind of, you know, how this CFI kind of collapse, so to speak, has impacted or not DeFi. And there's obviously no direct impact in terms of exposure, but a lot of indirect impact in terms of market sentiment and, you know, price moves. But and one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about that will be a potential result of this kind of collapse is more uh, regulation and obviously more regulation both on, on the CFI portion, but they could also spill over into DeFi. Like what's your view on um, how this will shift the regulatory uh, winds or how it will accelerate certain kind of trends that you maybe foresaw coming? Yeah, I think you have like kind of two competing uh, trends here. One is that, you know, in bear markets, uh, regulators tend to, you know, become a little bit less concerned, right? Like, you know, most regulators are, are worried about like speculative manias and, you know, uh, retail, you know, people coming in and, and getting burned by, you know, scams and, right. and things like that. Um, so I think in a bear market, uh, just because there's less noise about crypto, that kind of drops off. But then obviously, you know, you've got these like very real, Real uh, impacts in in the real world uh, to people who thought that they were putting money into you know uh, these crypto banks, right? Um, you know, in, in savings accounts, and that's just you know obviously been been exposed as uh, an extremely risky activity. Um, so I do think there will be uh, it'll, you know it, this is going to take a while to play out, um, and I I hope you know because it, it, it's somewhat it would be uh, somewhat frustrating. Um, you know, for CFI to, to kind of, you know, the contagion's been bad enough, let alone like regulatory yeah. contagion, right? Um, but I do feel like uh, regulators, uh, at least in, in you know, uh, some of the jurisdictions that, um, you know, obviously people are paying attention to US, I do feel like there is an awareness that like Celsius, um, you know, is not the same thing as Ave, right? Like, I, I feel like we've done a, a fairly okay. good job of, of education on that. Um, that said, you know, if there's a, a knee-jerk reaction from regulators because a bunch of people got burned, um, you know, by by this CFI uh, stuff, then you know it, it is possible to be more scrutiny. Um, but I feel like they might balance each other out. Those two forces, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. So in that sense, kind of want whatever's playing out right now to play out. But if the market bounces straight back, it could almost be worse from a regulatory perspective versus if we just kind Agreed. of stay in a. Yeah, you know, yeah. sideways or a bit bare for a while and just kind of it fizzles out a bit. 
as these yeah. liquidations yeah. Gets, gets processed. Exactly, um, exactly. There's also obviously a big difference between the C5 platforms, whether they were primarily B2B or B2C in terms of, you know, the B2B impact maybe is not as significant from a regulatory perspective. Whereas, you know, whenever there's uh, Cs involved, it, it becomes a lot more politically sensitive. Um, Absolutely. I, you know, I think uh, the, the, you know, kind of uh, PVP uh, sophisticated investors, you know, uh, kind of uh, out there eviscerating each other, um, you know, from a regulatory perspective, that's kind of fair game. Um, There's gladiators think, just battling it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know what, let them fight it out, see who, see who wins. Um, but yeah, when you turn up and say, um, you know, put your uh, your savings into this account and, you know, it's safe and we're going to pay you this yield, et cetera. Um, and, you know, a bunch of, uh, of retail, uh, you know, participants come in and, and buy into that narrative. Um, yeah, yeah. Then, then you've got problems for sure. Uh, one of the things, just bringing it back to synthetics, I mean, I've got quite a number of topics I'd like to, to discuss, but um, two, I, I wanna make sure that we, we, we touch upon um, is, is governance and, and layer two. Um, on, on governance, um, you know, synthetics has kind of gone through a, a transition, right? From when it started to now in terms of being more and more decentralized. Maybe talk us a little bit through about that because it, it's a question a lot of people have. And I know that, um, you know, you're, you're very pro kind of starting out pretty much as a DAO nowadays, because it's, I guess the tooling is totally different from when you started in terms of allowing that, whereas it wasn't, literally wasn't possible back in the day. Um, and, and then there's this question from people of, well, don't you need to be centralized initially to you know, get things done, build it, and then kind of let it go and ship it. How, how do you, how has synthetics progressed through that? And, and you know, what, what can people learn from that? And versus how would you see them doing it now, given, you know, we're quite a number of years hence and there's a lot more tooling and knowledge available. Yeah, I, you know, I still think that there are a number of approaches that the market is testing out to see which one will be the optimal one. As you pointed out, my, my preference is, um, and, you know, the projects that I mentor and, and work with, um, you know, I really push them to go DAO uh, first and, and, you know, try and decentralize as much as possible. I think there is this misunderstanding. Um, you know, I was, I was in a governance uh, symposium or a forum uh, yesterday and someone uh, kind of made this comment, which, which I think it exists out, out in the market, that, um, you know, if you were to go uh, with like a, a council style, um, approach like we do in synthetics where there's eight people yeah. um, that are that are kind of voted in to make decisions um, that that might be too centralized um, and I think the interesting thing is that that is a bit of a, a, a kind of a, a belief that just has existed in crypto that you know if you consolidate decision making power into too few hands that it will become centralized yeah. almost definitionally um, and I think that's a bit mistaken mainly because we don't we didn't we have better tooling now, but we didn't have very good tooling for creating accountability. I think the the uh, the thing that offsets that and and prevents it be, from becoming centralized um, is that if you have accountability um, and you know uh, the the people that are making those decisions are kind of beholden to stakeholders and token holders, then you can actually consolidate decision making power while uh, you know keeping decentralization. Right. Um, and I, I think, think that that's it's an approach that's it's hard to get it exactly right, but it, I think it is possible to do. And I guess it also depends a little bit on how, because there's a general theory that when people get power, they want to hold on to it and they kind of consolidate it and they get more and more powerful. I guess it also depends on the mechanics around the council in terms of how are they voted in? How long do they sit for? What does it take to get them out if they seem to be doing things that you know, the ecosystem doesn't like? How does it work with, uh, with, with your, your council? Yeah, so I, and again, I, I think that there is, uh, this is something we haven't done a, as good a job as I would like in synthetics. Um, there's a, a big misunderstanding or just lack of awareness of what synthetics governance has evolved into over the last you know, four years. Um, my personal preference, and obviously I'm biased, um, you know, is uh, for this council style approach, um, because I think you get uh, sort of concentrated decision-making power. Um, you have this representative democracy um, style mechanism where you have specific people who can be held accountable. You don't have diffusion of responsibility, et cetera. But we also have a lot of checks and balances, right? So we do three-month 
uh, epochs for elections. So you don't have people in there for three years or 30 right. years or, or something like that. Like can they get reelected? They can, they can. But the interesting thing is there's actually quite a lot of turnover. Um, okay. You know, uh, people, uh, there's turnover for a, a number of reasons. I think there's turnover because a lot of the people who are participating are also building other projects in the ecosystem. Yeah. And it's really hard to maintain uh, the level of engagement you need on a council um, while you're doing multiple things, you know, while you're building. So people will jump in for three months and then they might jump out for three months and jump back in, um, which helps with turnover um, and helps with not having this kind of ossification. Um, but yeah, it's overall, um, it's allowed us to continue. And I would, I would argue maybe even accelerate our, um, our kind of implementation speed uh, whilst, you know, retaining centralization. There's no one person in the project, it's, it's especially me, right? Like it's been interesting in this epoch. Um, I found it personally quite frustrating because a lot of the things that I've been pushing for on my personal agenda have been rejected by the other council members. Okay. We've got a, a much more dovish uh, council, I think, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the things that um, that I'd like to see done. So it's it's just a very interesting dynamic. And as far as I can see, I've listened to some of the sessions. I mean, you record them and you put them up on on the synthetics podcast, right? Channel. So you, you pretty much all the sessions where decisions are made are recorded and put up there, right? There's no kind That's of right. dealing yeah. where it's all in public. decision making where it's not out there. Yeah. yeah. It's all in public. Yeah. I, and so I, I think there is one, there's one thing that's worth kind of calling out um, because a lot of projects hear this and they, they worry. They're like, but we need to make decisions, um, you know, in, in the background sometimes like there's sometimes conversations are sensitive or whatever. So it's not to say that there is no, uh, you know, place for a conversation that happens in private. One of the nice things about having a council is you are delegating the responsibility of decision making to these people and so if there is a sensitive topic that needs to be discussed um you know in the background or you know behind closed doors you can do that you can have that conversation and then you can come out and say we're going to do x or we're going to do y and here's that decision um you know process that we went through but you don't necessarily need to discuss all of the low level details um and i think that that's something that's important for people to to kind of understand i guess um you know in in comparison to uh maybe some of the like pure token voting things where it's really hard to have a conversation that's sensitive, you know, um, uh, in that way. Got it. And, and in terms of um, on, on the layer two side, uh, obviously you've, uh, you're an optimism. You've uh, been involved very early there and also contributed a lot to that project. Also, a lot of these things are also because you're an early project, right? Like when you made those decisions, there wasn't that breadth of a, a, a big of a menu to even choose from, right? Um, yeah. you know, but I, I, I've heard you state, uh, you know, that optimism you think is going to be the, the best technology for a number of years. And then maybe in the long term, you know, ZKs are going to potentially take over as a the more you know, a superior technology. How do you think about that in terms of building an optimism, investing in the ecosystem now versus then? Is it a transition in the future? Is it like you're just across all of them or because synthetics kind of cuts across all these protocols, it, you know, people, it's up to the users to then just choose what, what infrastructure they, they're on. Yeah, I think that's where we need to get to. You know, um, it, right now uh, we have to be a bit more opinionated than we have been for quite a while. That you know we have to support a roll up. Um, one of the things about infrastructure, I think that's interesting in the space, is the people building the infrastructure have a very, very different perspective than the people who are building the protocols, um, even if they are building a protocol themselves. So like Chainlink was a great example of this, right? Had we not worked closely with Chainlink the way we did for you know maybe six months or nine months before we transitioned right. to, to Chainlink Oracles, I think Chainlink, it would have taken them a lot longer to get to the level of kind of robustness. And even today we work really closely with them because our needs are different to what you know, their needs are, right? And in terms of you know, how we consume the protocol, the same thing was true with Optimism. Um, you know, Optimism was building a scaling solution. We're building, you know, a DeFi protocol and the requirements that we have are not necessarily, you know, obvious or, or naturally obvious to uh, the people who are building that scaling solution. So having that very like tight collaboration uh, early on gives us a seat at the table to kind of help craft where this goes and, and you know, ensure that it goes in the right direction. Um, but also, you know, uh, has accelerated, I think, even though it's taken longer than, than we would like, I think it would have taken even longer if it had been all of the DeFi protocols just kind of waiting for someone to turn up and be like, here is the solution to you know, the world's right. problems for you. Right, right. 
and and um, in terms of uh, the LC2 narrative, you feel like that's playing out this year? Ha has it been hindered or accelerated in any way by what's going on in the market? It, it's close. Uh, I think, you know, I've, I've had a number of conversations uh, with people, uh, you know, in the last week uh, where it feels like we're getting there. Um, you know, the, the critical thing for uh, L222, I think, is that we get to a level of parity in terms of like liquidity and market efficiency on the L2s as we have on L1. Um, and there was, uh, there were, I think, a number of things were kind of holding that back, right? Bridges and, and some other stuff. But it does feel like we're, we're kind of getting there. The other thing I think that really helps is like the alt L1 thesis that, you know, was really being bolstered by incredible price action for the last 18 months. Once that price action turns negative, you know, the, the narrative kind of um, tarnishes a little bit. So I think that uh, the scaling narrative and, and this idea of like Ethereum uh, as, you know, um, this the bigger, this you know, kind of bigger uh, uh, thing than just L1 um, is something that is probably going to become a little bit easier to communicate. Uh, to the wider community um, when you don't have all that background noise from, you know, all of these other uh, L1 chains. Got it. And in, in terms of, obviously, you've had a great launch this year with Atomic Swaps, and that's really generating a lot of, uh, you know, fees to the stakers, activities, uh, um, you know, uh, volume on, on synthetics. What, in terms of looking forward for the remainder of the year and into next year, what what are you working on right now? You are the the team, the ecosystem, the the council that uh, has you has you really excited. And obviously, yeah, it could also be what has you personally excited versus what's actually being done in synthetics. Not always the same, right? Because of the, the governance it's structure. Not. But what, what what are you personally very excited about the potential of? I, I think we have uh, seen product market fit on atomic swaps now. It's like the, the first thing that's really yeah. uh, kind of gotten to product market fit. Um, and what that does, I think it's kind of ties into uh, an emerging narrative and, and an emerging meme, which is this idea that we have a new scoreboard, right? Um, we've had multiple scoreboards over the years. We had, you know, token data back in the day, which tracked ICO raises and everyone was looking at who has raised the most, the fastest or whatever. Um, and then it evolved into DeFi pulse ahead of uh you know DeFi summer and that became the metric was tvl and it was like who can you know get to the top of the scoreboard um i think now we have crypto fees and crypto fees is the closest thing to like a fundamental actual valuable score that we've ever had in in crypto i think you know who's actually paying for these services and you know are the the people that are paying for them uh you know is it sustainable i guess like are we are we getting close to a sustainable ecosystem so Synthetics, you know, I'm very excited. Uh, sorry, I, I just dropped out for a second there. Um, with synthetics, I'm very excited for, to kind of lean into this fee generation and, and you know, um, hopefully uh, kind of continue this process of, uh, of really, you know, driving uh, protocol revenue. Um, okay. And that's going to come from a bunch of places. Great. Um, well, I think we're all very excited about uh, synthetics, what's going on right now and what's, what's coming up uh, in, in the future um, from, from you and from, from the council. So really appreciate you taking the time with us today to, to walk us through the, the, you know, your background, synthetic background, tell us a bit about the project and also what, you know, what's going on looking forward. Thank you very much, Kane. Yeah, thanks, Casper. It was really fun.